relationships, a mess worth making. This is a book by Timothy Lane and Paul David Tripp. Uh, and so I am not necessarily basing it off of the book. I just love the title of this book. That relationships are messy. They're always difficult. It's difficult to have relationships because you have somebody else who thinks for themselves on the other side of that relationship. But it is the most fulfilling thing that you can do, is have a relationship. And there are various different types of relationships. But the truth is, the Bible teaches us that we were designed for relationships, right? Adam is made, and he has, uh, God wants to find a helper for Adam. And so Eve is created. You were designed for relationships. And as Christians, we believe in this thing called the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so God, in his very nature, is in relationship with the Son and the Holy Spirit. That is what we believe about the Trinity. So you were designed for relationships, you're made in the image of God, and you are called to relationships. Now when I say relationships, sometimes we think of husband and wife, but there are various different relationships. And we talked about, um, Chris spoke on mentor and mentee relationships, which are so important. It's basically what he talked about is discipleship. And so these are important, that we have somebody ahead of us, but we also have somebody behind us as well. Next week, we'll talk about what it looks like to have spiritual friendship, what it looks like to have a equal who you are being encouraged by. And I'll share some stories about some people who have impacted my life very greatly. And Last week, Brad preached about the spouse relationship, right? And so this relationship actually looks a bit different. Not everybody is married, but you can still glean some important information out of that sermon. And I appreciate both of them preaching those past two weeks. Well, this week, we, get, we even narrow the focus even more. We talk about parenting. What does it look like? To have a godly relationship as a parent. Here's the truth about people. You cannot change people. You can't change people. I can't change you. You can't change me. Uh, a lot of times when we're looking for people to be transformed, we get frustrated that they don't change sometimes. God changes people. But children are actually different. We have the most influence on children. They're the most vulnerable people in society. And we get to give them information and they get to process that information. And the truth is you can really mess up this relationship or you can give them such a solid foundation that they become influential to the kingdom of God. And so this is important. This is why it's so important. Parenting is so important. But it's also intimidating. It's also overwhelming. So you might ask the question, does this pertain to me? I don't have any kids or, uh, you know, various ones of us have kids, but a lot of us don't have kids or our kids are growing up. Does this pertain to us? Well, the truth is that you help raise the next generation. No matter what stage of life you are at, you get to participate in helping raise the next generation. And it's especially important in a church to help this next generation and help raise them up and lead them. 1 Timothy 5, 1 through 2. This is Paul writing to Timothy and encouraging him as he leads a church. This is what he says. Paul writing to Timothy. Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. What Paul is saying here is, Timothy, you have a role to play, and in fact, everybody in that church, you have a role to play in the relationship you have with them and they have with you. Parenting and mentoring, which is what Timothy was doing, have a lot in common. And let us join in on the task of raising up 
the next generation. This should be exciting and intimidating at the same time. Now, I, I want to give a warning here. I am probably very hypocritical in this. And so here's what I mean by that. There's a lot of times I try to preach something and then practice it as well, right? And so if I'm saying, hey, you shouldn't lie, I try not to lie in my daily life or whatever it may be, living out Jesus in my life. But the truth is I miss the mark here, right? I am not always the best parent, and I'm in the learning process of this. And so uh, one of the reasons why I had Brad preach about um, the marriage relationship was he's been doing it a lot longer than I have. Well, he's also been doing uh, parenting a lot longer than I have. And so I want to put this up here that I don't have it all perfect. And you might see that. Here's the truth. I have a lot of head knowledge about parenting, but it hasn't worked its way to my heart. And so this is a discipleship process for me and hopefully for you as well, that as we learn this information, the point of me preaching is not for you to get it in your head and understand that information, but then for it to move to your heart and you be discipled by what the Bible teaches on these things. Certainly, I have some things right now. I do have wonderful kids, in my opinion. You might disagree, but I certainly think that my kids are fantastic. And I told Joshua that I was preaching this sermon about parenting, and I said, hey, uh, what should I say about parenting? And this is what he said to me. It was very sweet. He said, well, I think you should tell them that him, speaking about him, that I love you, Daddy, and that you he wants you guys to know that your kids should love you too. And so I was encouraged by that. It's interesting that my son can encourage me in that as well. But we've also, over the past couple of weeks, had some difficult parenting experience as well. We went on vacation, and so every time your kids are out of their own setting and you're doing a lot of fun things, like kids are addicted to fun. It's crazy how addicted to fun they are. They just want to do more. It's not like, oh yeah, we, we did all these fun things and now we are set for the year. No, they just want to have more and more fun. And this week, um, Madison, with the most beautiful curls in the world, <laughs> decided to cut those curls off. My heart was broken, uh, but she looks fantastic anyway. But of course, uh, when I first saw her, uh, I was having difficulty adjusting to this new haircut. And so I might have said, you look like an old lady. And uh, that's a, it was okay. I think my, my wife yelled at me, but I think it was okay. See, I want her to realize what, how bad she did. Like, this is wrong. I wanted her to feel so terrible about it. And my wife on the other hand is like, no, but we have to tell her that she's beautiful. So. You might think, oh, that was bad parenting, and it certainly was, but it, it gets worse. My son is a parrot, and so after hearing me say that, every time somebody would say to Madison, your haircut looks very nice, he would tell them she looks like an old lady. So there is a uh, big, and my wife definitely scolded me for that, deservedly so. But see, there's, there's some good and some bad, and so I'm, I'm working on this, but hopefully today is a sermon that really helps you figure out, like, how can I be helpful in raising the next generation? So, today, in your um, bulletin, you have a way to follow along and fill in answers. Um, hopefully, if you want to do that, that's fantastic. If you don't want to do that, just set it off to the side. You do not have to worry about that. But I figured this is a way for you to take it throughout the week. You can write this down and really think and meditate on these things as you go throughout the week. One great way is there are Bible verses on there. You can read those Bible verses in context. And so a lot of times I'm taking these verses out of context 
and explaining them. But one of the best things you can do for your faith is read them in context. Read the whole chapter of Proverbs, that the verses that I'm giving you, and better understand them. And so I have two myths about parenting and three principles of parenting. So myth number one is you should feel guilty about what you're doing wrong. You should feel guilty about what you're doing wrong. It seems like we're always feeling the most guilty about two relationships, right? The first one is children. We always feel guilty about what I didn't do or how I messed up or how I missed on this relationship of children. And then also parents. If, we're, if you have elderly parents or uh, just parents who have certain expectations on you, they can sometimes, uh, it can feel overwhelming and we can feel guilty about those relationships as well. We have pressure to do well. And here's the truth about this pressure to do well, especially when it comes to parenting. This pressure is a good thing. We should feel pressure about doing well. It is such an important job to parenting that you should feel some pressure. There's high stakes involved here. It is super important that there is high stakes here. For you to realize that, for you to understand, hey, this is a high call. Parenting is a high call. But guilt is not the correct response to this high calling. See, the truth about guilt is that it's from the devil. Conviction is from God. And so the difference between guilt and conviction, I think we miss this sometimes, but it is so important to understand what these terms both mean. Guilt says, you messed up. You have messed up so badly. You have done something terribly wrong, and there is no saving you from this mess. You're never going to get better, and that becomes crippling. And when something becomes crippling, we are left to not move into action. See, the problem with guilt is it holds you down. It holds you back, and it's a tool of the devil to make you stop moving and to say, you have messed up so bad, there's no overcoming this. And that is a lie from the devil. We can have these thoughts. I, what if I mess up again? What if I do something terrible? But I will tell you, that if you have guilt, you need to rebuke it. Because it is from the devil. This holding you down, this always reminding you, hey, remember that time when you messed up? And then you do something right again. And maybe you do five right things, but then out of here comes another, hey, remember that time that you messed up? Over and over and over again. Now, let's go back. Remember, this pressure is a good thing. You do do things wrong as a parent. You do things wrong in all of your relationships. And so that is why conviction is so important. That is from the Holy Spirit. Conviction is, hey, the Holy Spirit tells me I have messed up. I have done something wrong. But it doesn't cripple me. Instead, it moves me into action to fix the situation. When you make mistakes, you should get good at apologizing. You, in fact, what I would say is you can apologize to your kids when you make a mistake. It's okay. You're not perfect. But there's also another part of this that we miss in our societies. When you make a mistake and you apologize, you should also seek restitution for that mistake. Reconciliation. You should try to make it better. If I crash into somebody's house, I should pay for the damages, right? That's the kind of process. And this is what we should do in all of our relationships. And conviction moves you into action to do that. So if you feel like you haven't been being a good parent, you've messed up or you've made mistakes, have conviction not guilt. We must live out of conviction and not guilt. The second myth 
and this is so common in our society, is parenting is a burden. Parenting is a burden. Now I don't get to do all the things that I want to do. And this worldview is humongous in our society. That parenting is a burden. I remember so many times having children, when we'd have children, especially the first one, and they'd say, well, kiss your free time goodbye. It is so interesting that our society looks so down upon that. It's, now, here's the truth. Parenting is consuming and difficult, but it is also a blessing. Now, there are these parents out there that do everything for their kids, right? It's a helicopter parent. It's an overemphasis on them, and they want to do everything for them. They do 20 sports, and they're, uh, each kid is in 20 sports, and they're running around. And that is also a problem. The thing about kids is that you should be incorporating them into your daily life. And so yes, you do things for them, but you they also do things along with you. I love it when I watch parents who are so good at doing something and bringing their child in with them. They're teaching their child as they're doing it. Their child is watching and interested in what they are doing. This is so important. We must take the extra time to teach our kids and walk with them. That is our responsibility. To re-emphasize that children are not a burden, but a blessing, the Bible reinforces this over and over and over again. So I'm just going to give a couple examples here. But the first one is Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5. It says this, Children are a heritage from the Lord. Offspring, a reward from Him. That your children are actually a blessing from God. They are given to you by God to steward them well, but also to love them. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior. Our children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contended with their opponents in court. So, what, this is what I will say. Christians should have lots of kids. They should have lots of kids. We should all have lots of kids. First of all, uh, one myth of our society is that we have overpopulation. The real smart people in the rooms say, no, we actually have a population sh uh, shortage, right? That we are lacking and growing in population because of, we're not having kids at the level of replacement. So we should have lots of children. But children are the best way to build culture, and they are such a blessing. And the Bible repeats that they are a blessing over and over and over again. But again, society thinks it's a curse. It's a burden to have kids. And I think the biggest problem is that our society teaches individualism. That your happiness, your fulfillment is the most important thing. That your happiness and your fulfillment, whatever, just follow your heart. Just do whatever you can. Well, do whatever makes you happy. This is a lie. It's not true. You should not follow your heart. You should not do whatever makes you happy. Because you are a fallen human being that doesn't fully understand what leads to true joy from God. Our individualism has destroyed our society. And, but parenting is all about being for others. Putting their wants and their desires above you. And now I'm not preaching self-sabotaging. I'm not saying, hey, you should never do anything that makes you happy. You should never do anything that makes you feel fulfilled. But you should go out of your way to be for others. Because guess what? This is what true fulfillment looks like. When you start to live for others, when you start to be about others, 
that's when you find the greatest fulfillment. So dispelling those two myths, what is the point of parenting? What is the point of parenting? Well, the truth is that the point of parenting is being God's agent. God's representation to our kids. One thing that Joshua always tells me is that how does he know that God is real? He's never seen God. Well, it's our responsibility to show God to our children. We are pointing beyond ourselves. That parenting is a bigger thing than you. It's a higher calling than you. And it is pointing beyond ourselves. Again, a very high calling. And everything that we do should be about getting them closer to God. So we don't do things so that they are uh, these perfect human beings. We don't raise them to be uh, to seek after riches of this world. We don't seek them to raise them to seek after fame, but to seek after God. That the point of this relationship, and what I would say about most relationships that you are in, is about sanctification. It's about being drawn to God, that you are being made in the image of Jesus, remade in the image of Jesus. And that is the point of actually every single relationship. So yes, that neighbor that really upsets you and makes you frustrated, that just drives you crazy. Sam, I, I know which one you're thinking, but uh, I live next to Sam, so. But, <laughs> but every single relationship, that crazy neighbor that drives you crazy, is drawing you closer to God, is helping you not get angry the next time, to show Christ to them, your children, that your relationship with them, you are drawing them closer to God. And so, as God's agents, what do we do as parents? What do we do as parents? Well, the first one is that we're actually called to discipline them. To discipline them. Now, in our society, sometimes we've actually gotten away from disciplining kids. But I will say, this is one of your main purposes. is to discipline. Now, this comes... The, the etymology of this word is it comes from the Latin word to train or instruct. And you might notice that discipline and discipleship have the same start. And that is important. That actually raising kids is a discipleship process. But I will say that we don't discipline to get correct behavior. Now, certainly that's a piece of it and a part of it, but what I will say is that um, if you're seeking for correct behavior, it can be problematic because kids adjust, right? Sometimes you will tell them, hey, you cannot do that, and they don't do that, but they, man, they get very close to that line, and then they say, listen, I, I didn't do what you told me not to do, but I just got very close to it. Instead, you discipline because you want their heart to be in the right place. And here is the thing that sometimes when you teach them correct behavior and they start doing that, then when they, they, they might fall away in their teen years, but then when they grow up, they remember, oh yeah, my parents said this was correct behavior. But truly, it's all about the heart. So I'm going to read an often quoted verse, Proverbs 13, 24, that says, Whoever spares the rod hates their child, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. So this is a verse that many people talk about, and all right, are we going to spank the kids and not spank the kids? Whatever, but what I want us to notice in this is the word love. The word love is put there. That when we discipline our kids, it's all about love. 
the center of this verse is about love. It's not necessarily spanking or not spanking or uh, being careful to discipline them. It's all about love. And so, yeah, we should discipline our kids because we love them. But also because we want their heart to follow after Jesus. So are we correcting heart behavior, not outward behavior. And this is really important because Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. That actually, that incorrect behavior that is happening is because their heart is not right. It's not vice versa. Jesus says this amazing thing. This is the words of Jesus in Luke 45, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So when we discipline our kids, are we focused on correcting their heart? Are we just focused on on correcting the behavior. I'm not saying that it's not bad to discipline them because they're doing bad behavior, but it should all be towards the heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand him? Later, Jeremiah will say, Hey, there is one thing that will cure the heart, and that's the Messiah. That God will make a new covenant with us and we will have new hearts. But I want to give two examples of the heart not being in the correct place. The heart deceiving us. And the first one is about my heart not being in the right place. As I discipline my kids, I, uh, I care way too much about what people think. Here's the truth. I probably think more about what you think of me than you thinking about me. That's just the truth. I care so much about what people think, and it's a huge fault of mine. And so I'm always thinking, do people think I am a bad parent? I'm always thinking this. What do they think of me as a parent? And one day, I was at a friend's house, and Joshua was misbehaving. But I didn't notice that he was misbehaving. I actually wasn't really paying attention, and the only time I noticed Joshua was misbehaving is when I saw other people kind of look at me funny like he was misbehaving. And so what did I do? It was, it was my perception that he was misbehaving or other people thought he was misbehaving, and I disciplined him. Now the Lord convicted me, not because he was or was not misbehaving or being bad, but because I disciplined out of my own selfish desires of how I would look to other people. I wanted to look like a good parent. I didn't want to be a good parent. My heart was in the wrong place. Now, I'm not saying I should have, should not have disciplined, but if my heart was in a right place, the disciplining would have been for the right reason. But also, children also do this as well. Their hearts are a little deceitful too, and we find children to be pure, and they're mostly bad, right? Their hearts are so wonderful. In fact, Jesus says, let the little children come to me. But we see self-preservation come out of children at a very early age. My children will do things wrong, and I'll say, oh my, who did this? Who spilled this milk on the floor? And my children will lie about it. I'll say, oh, I, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And then finally, we find out who did it. And we might punish that particular child. And of course, they always think it's because they spilled the milk, not because they lied. Now, children are lying because their hearts are being deceitful. They just want to get out of trouble. They don't want to 
be in trouble. Our hearts can be deceitful. And we must discipline out of a right place. Our hearts must be right. But also seeking to correct their heart as well. And correct it towards Jesus. And so this is when you're disciplining to have a heartward focus heart devoted towards Jesus. We want our children to be devoted towards Jesus, and we need to be as well. The second point, the second um, representation of being a God's agent is the fact that you need help. You need help raising that. Maybe you're insulted by this, or maybe you're like, yeah, this is very true. But uh, you've probably heard before that it takes a village to raise children. Now, this is a Nigerian proverb, and it is important. The Bible says this, Proverbs thirteen twenty: Walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. We need the wisdom of people who have gone before us. People with adult children who are serving God, those are probably the most important people that you can have a relationship with. If you see people who have adult children that are following God, get close to them. Find out what they did. So important. Spend time with them. Get advice from them. There are so many times that we get advice from the wrong people. But truly, we need advice from people who are doing things well. Now, uh, when I first started dating my wife, uh, she was getting dating advice from somebody who is not in a relationship. <laughs> I said, please stop getting advice from her because she doesn't understand. Let's, let's talk to this other person who has had experience. But we find this in the Bible too, that there are many people who follow the wrong person's advice and get into trouble. Now, one thing that you should understand about the Bible is the book of Proverbs was written by Solomon, who was David's son. And David wrote all these Psalms, and one of the passages we read is from the Psalms. And so they are focused on wisdom. They, in fact, they wrote most of the wisdom books in the Bible. But, you know, it's funny that Solomon's son did not follow the wise. In fact, he went to somebody who was unwise, and what happened was the kingdom was split. And if you read the later part of the Old Testament, what you find is that there's actually two kingdoms. There's Israel and Judah, because he was not being wise. He was not going to people who were wiser than him. I thought it was interesting that last week, Brad's sermon was all about this friend who helped teach him how to be in a relationship. Then he talks about his friend Dean, who his son is named after, that he listened, he saw that Dean was wise, and he listened to that. But here's the thing. What I will say is that we need to be around wise people who will help us. We need people to also have our children to have a relationship with people who experience Jesus. The most important thing you can do is have your children be around people who have experienced Jesus. Who are encountering Jesus in a supernatural way. And that is why it is so important to be a part of a church. Because you have all these people who are encountering Jesus together. The last part of being God's agent is that, and I, there's way more than this, I'm just giving a piece of it, but the third point is to teach your children cultural discernment, not cultural rejection. So, yes, our culture is messed up. There are so many bad things about our culture. But the best skill that you can teach your kids is how to process information and come to the conclusion of what is bad 
and what is good. This is such an important part of raising our kids and shepherding our kids through the appropriate stages. Obviously, you're not going to teach them everything, but you're going to teach them how to process information, how to love people and love God. Our culture teaches all these false things. An acceptance of secularism in the popular culture, in the public culture, sexuality and identity, sources of truth, and the appropriate response to drugs and alcohol. And here's the truth, though. You cannot shelter your kids from these things. The society will not let you shelter your kids from these things. Now, you can certainly shepherd them at particular stages, but once they get to the adult stage, they're going to be thrown into that world. And if you shelter them, they have no shot. But if you teach them cultural discernment and shelter them when it's appropriate to shelter them and teach them principles that will be a guiding principle throughout all of life, maybe that love is the appropriate um, way, but that love also requires obedience. They, they're made in the image of God, and that is why they should be seeking to live up to that standard. We will be able to raise kids that know how to reject falsehood. That know, hey, this isn't my parents' decision, it is my decision. Cultural discernment is so important. Because we need to help teach kids how to think through what is right and what is wrong. If we just shelter them, they might be in for a shock. Now obviously I'm not saying, hey, teach little kids about sexuality. No, they're too young for that. It is obvious that they are not ready for that. But we obviously have to teach kids at the time of puberty about sexuality or else they're going to go and figure it out from a different source. So I, I just want to talk about five practices to do with your kids to create a biblical worldview. And that's what I'm going to end with. It's in your bulletin. It will be up on the screen as well. But the first one is to be praying with your kids. You should be praying in front of your kids. You should be watching your kids pray. You should be correcting their prayers sometimes. Right? So uh, maybe my, my daughters, they always pray for, God, thank you for unicorns. Right? And so obviously unicorns aren't real. And so there is some, hey, God, thank you for the person who came up with the idea of unicorns because we enjoy thinking about unicorns, right? So pray with your kids. They should watch you pray. They should learn how to pray from you. Jesus' disciples learned to pray from him, but you should also be watching them pray. A any of these things, you should be doing it. This is how Jesus did things. He, he taught about it, then he did those things, then he watched his disciples do those things and correct it, and then he sent them out to go do them. And I think if Jesus does that, we should do that with everything. The next thing is to spend quality time with kids, but also quantity time with kids. We should spend a lot of time with our children, because that is how they learn. We, our society has emphasized uh, quality time, which I think is important. We need to learn to put away our phones and spend quality time with our kids, but we also need to spend a lot of time with our kids. The next thing is to work through difficult things with them. They should watch us as we process through mourning and loss and grief. We try to hide our grief from our children. But one of the best ways to show Jesus is to walk with them through it. Your grief, their grief. Next thing is eating meals together. 
SATs that the, there was something done on, hey, why are all a bunch of these kids getting great SAT scores? And it wasn't, uh, a lot of people think it's reading books to kids at a young age, which is so important, we should be doing that. And that is a high indicator for high SAT scores. But the number one reason that kids scored highly on SATs was they at least ate one meal together a day with the family. We should be eating together. And the last one is read and discuss the Bible together. Read and discuss it. Yeah, read those hard parts too. Those ones that we try to hide away from kids when they're ready to read those parts. We should be reading those parts as well. And showing them how we interpret them. All in real time as we walk with them towards God. It's a journey together. Again, children are difficult, but they are our future. And we want to build a generation of kingdom builders. And so I want to encourage you guys to, in whatever stage of life you're at, join in on this. Help us raise kids so that they love God, so that they know God and encounter God. Would you stand with me as we pray? Lord, we thank you for the blessing of children. I thank you that you have uh, filled our church full of kids, that uh, many of our church members are having kids, and we thank you so much for that. And we just pray, don't stop now. I think of all the kids that sat down at community today doing a craft. Lord, we pray for them, and we pray that they would come in, and they would encounter and know you. Lord, let us be a church that is known by how much we care about the next generation. Help us encounter you. Let us be like little children who run to Jesus because we can't help ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.